Thank you for your interest in watching or listening to this sermon preached at North Point Baptist Church. Our hope is that our preaching ministry serves you well. We do, however, wish to strongly discourage you from using this or any other of our sermons as your primary means of spiritual nourishment. We urge that you would seek this spiritual nourishment in the context of a local church under the care of pastors and members who know and love you. May our contribution to your spiritual life in this sermon be only a small supplement to the ministry at your local church. Blessings in Christ, the elders of North Point Baptist Church, Nairobi. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we began uh, a series in the book of Mark. Uh, last week, we were in the first 15 verses, and we were thinking together about how God prepared the people for Christ and how God prepared Christ for the people. And so today we pick up from where we left off. We are in verse 16 all the way to verse 28. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him, and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And this is the word of the Lord. Title of our sermon this morning is He is the Captain Now. He is the captain now. There are many things that people fear in the workplace. Things like having a terrible boss or being overworked or generally working in what we call a toxic work environment. It's a very relative phrase, can apply to a whole range of issues. The lack of coffee in the office to terrible boss. But very high up on that list can also be added being given responsibility and not being given the authority to do it. Now, there's a famous quote on this which says that responsibility without authority is slavery. It's very hard to accomplish one's tasks at work if one does not have the power to do so. You can't direct colleagues to do certain tasks because they will look at you and say, I don't report to you. Who died and made you the CEO? You can't authorize funding or access needed information because you'll be told that's above your pay grade. 
and it becomes very frustrating. At a more domestic level, you can feel the same frustration if you ever have to take care of someone's unruly children. And those children know that you can't discipline them in any way. You have responsibility, but you have no authority. What to you? This morning it is my genuine delight to tell you that Jesus does not have that problem. We can take solace in the fact that our Savior Jesus Christ can do what he came to do. Whatever work he set out to do in your heart today, whatever work he set out to do in your life today, he can get it done and nothing will get in his way. In our passage this morning, Mark will work to show us that Jesus not only has responsibility as the Messiah, but he also has the authority to carry it out. If you're here this morning and you're, and you're not a Christian, it means that, that you have entrusted yourself, you have submitted yourself to something or someone other than Jesus. And our question to you this morning is, can that thing or person truly accomplish salvation for you? Does it have the power, the authority to deliver? As Christians, we, we think that only Jesus can do that, and, and we hope to convince you of that this morning. So here is what I will be seeking to argue from our passage this morning. The assignment of Christ advances by the authority of Christ. The assignment of Christ advances by the authority of Christ. You will notice that the authority of Christ is uh, the main theme in our passage. The, the word is repeated twice. It seems to stand out about him in the minds of those who interact with him in our passage. Uh, we do, in fact, in our passage, see three exercises that reveal Christ's authority in the text. Three things he does that reveal his authority in the text. Number one, authority in his call. Number two, authority in his creed or his teaching. Number three, authority in his command. Authority in his call, his creed, and his command. That's our outline for those of you who are taking notes. First, authority in his call. The text opens with a Jesus who is on the move. You see in verse 16 that he is passing alongside the Sea of Galilee. He's passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, and we know that what he is passing alongside doing is what we left off last week. He is preaching the gospel of God. He has been prepared, as we saw in last week's message. He has begun preaching the gospel. He is calling people to repentance. And so when we see the movement he is on, we are to see him as a man on a mission. He is a man on assignment. And so what does he do? How does he go about this assignment? Well, it seems that the first order of business is for him to call some men to join him, to recruit men to join him. And this is what happens in the section between verse 16 all the way to verse 20. There we find two sets of brothers, Simon and Andrew, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. We are told that these four men are all fishermen. When Jesus is passing, Simon and Andrew are fishing, and John and James are mending their nets. And what that scene describes is a fairly ordinary day in the life of these Galilean fishermen. Now, we know from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 35 to 42, when you have a chance, go check it out. We know that two of these men, namely Andrew and Peter, had been followers of John the Baptist. They were part of the crew that was baptized by John the Baptist. They actually are identified as disciples of John the Baptist. They are the ones that had been prepared by John the Baptist for the Christ. And when John the Baptist pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John and Andrew immediately became interested in Jesus. They had even spent a night 
at wherever it was Jesus had been staying, whatever Airbnb in Galilee Jesus had hired, they went and checked it out. Andrew and Simon had also most likely told John and James, who are their friends, we are told that in Luke chapter 5, about Jesus. Uh, they were going around saying, I think this guy is the promised one. I think he's the Messiah. And so when we read what is taking place here in this passage, we are not to think that this is the first time Jesus is interacting with this man, or this is the first time this man are interacting with Jesus. However, something new takes place. Jesus officially calls them. And so look again at verse 17 and 18 concerning Simon and Andrew. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then jump to verse 20 concerning James and John. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So consider the nature of what Christ is doing here. He's not inviting them to prayerfully consider following him. He's calling them. Jesus is assuming a place of authority over what they will do with the rest of their life. He tells them, I will make you become fishers of men. Jesus is proposing to redirect their entire occupation, to redirect their entire existence. Notice he gives them no guarantees concerning what they will eat, what they will drink, what they will wear. He offers no explanations about where their livelihood will come from. He just calls them to follow him. And look at what they do. They left their nets, they left their boats, and they followed him. They, they abandoned their professions, and they took up a whole new course of life. They were to be fishers of men, whatever that meant. This is a significant moment for these men, unbeknownst to them, they had signed up to be foundational players in a global movement and they would pay for it with their lives. All of them. And not just their jobs. In verse 20, we are told that John and James left their father Zebedee in the boat and followed Jesus. Did you notice Jesus did not ask Zebedee, Hey, can I have your sons? He just took them. Did you notice the immediacy of this call? Right then and there. Not two days later. Not after a week of consideration and thought. Immediately, they left their nets. They left their father. And they went off following Jesus. Only Jesus can do such things. And he has, he, he, he does such things throughout the, the New Testament because he has the authority to do so. Later in chapter 10, one day we'll get to it. He would tell a man, a rich man, to sell all of his property and take that money and not invest it in noble capital, but give it to the poor and then come and follow him. He will tell people to hate their father and their mother, meaning to be more committed to him than to them. Jesus reserves the right to call anyone he wants to live and or to die for him. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you, you may be under the impression that Christianity asks too much of you. And that's why you haven't come to Jesus. You're looking for a church or a message that will lower the entry standards a little bit. I want to tell you that, that you're wrong. It is not that Christ asks too much. Actually, he asks for everything. Any version of Christianity that only asks for some of your life and some of your attention 
and, and the rest can be spent on your other sinful desires. That's not true Christianity. Here Jesus exerts his authority and he demands all, oh, follow me. Whatever other plans you had for your life are now over and done with. Including what you had planned for this afternoon. It's done. Follow me. Whatever your parents may have planned for you, Zebedee. Whatever Zebedee had planned for you, John and James, it's over and done with. I am everything now. I am the captain now. That phrase is taken from the movie Captain Phillips. Those of you are wondering, where am I? What is this? A group of pirates take control of a freight ship, a container ship, and they take over it. And the, the head pirate comes and he speaks to whoever was the captain of the ship and says, look at me, look at me. I am the captain now. Well, in a much better way, this is what Jesus is doing. I am the captain now. But my non-Christian friend, please know that Jesus also offers all he is to him. He died in the place of sinners so that they may be saved and they can be blessed fully in him. He asks for all of you, yes. And he offers you all of himself. What a glorious deal that is. And we, we ask you to accept it today. Dear Saint, have you considered whose life you are living? You know, sometimes we, we speak as if our lives are our own. Whose job are you doing? What master are you serving? Who calls the shots in your life? Is it truly Jesus? In the way you are living your life right now, this past week, are you following Jesus? These two sets of brothers did not know what a future following Jesus entailed. They just responded to his authoritative call to them. So, dear saint, are you where Jesus has called you to be? Are you doing what Jesus has called you to do? And also, dear saints, are you giving the submission owed to Jesus to someone or something else? Please note that no one else should have this degree of authority over your life. Not your spouse. Not your parents. Not your employer. Not your man of God. A woman of God. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And so, I want to call upon you, if you are under the thumb of some false Messiah, to come out. Come out and submit to the authority of the true Messiah. There we see the first exercise of authority of Jesus in his right to call us to do and to be whatever he wishes. But this is not where his authority ends, for yet another sphere of his authority is revealed in our text. Our second point, authority in his creed. Authority in his creed. So, Jesus, with his uh, band of four men, we can call them uh, an embryonic church. They head out to Capernaum. Capernaum, as we will see in next week's sermon, is the town where Peter's family lived. So for Simon and Andrew, Capernaum is familiar territory. So they're not excited that they have come to a new place. They're probably excited in, in wanting to see what, what Jesus will do. How will Jesus operate? Uh, what's he going to do? How is he going to act? Uh, Mark does not give us very many details. You will notice just in the book of Mark, he just doesn't go into details. He, he goes into the main idea. And so he takes us to what happens on the weekend, not Friday. But Saturday. So look at verse 21. And they, that's Jesus and his four disciples, went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. So they did what all Jews did on the Sabbath. 
they went into the synagogue. The synagogue was a place of assembly that the Jews would go into for worship and for instruction. Jesus gets an opportunity to preach. He's, he's a 30-year-old man, which was the age at which uh, men would graduate into becoming rabbis. And so he, he's given an opportunity to, to teach. Now, we are not told anything about what he taught. We don't know whether he read a text, as he did in Luke chapter 4. Uh, we don't know what themes he expounded on, as he does in Matthew chapter 5 all the way to 7. All Mark want, all Mark wants us to know, all Mark cares about, is the impression that his teaching created. And so look at verse 22. Jesus ends the sermon, and this is what the impression was. The people, we are told, they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as their scribe. The people were shocked. They were dumbfounded. They were amazed. They were astonished. Their jaws are on the floor. Not because of the beauty of his teaching. Not because of the eloquence of his words. Not because of the interesting nature of his topic. Oh, he really addressed a, a need I have in my life. That's not what's going on. They are shocked because of his authority. He taught them as one who had authority. They were struck by a force and a power that they had not known before. Now, you notice that the people can tell a clear difference between how Jesus taught and how their scribes taught. His creed, his doctrine, his teaching was authoritative. Their creed was speculative. Uh, the scribes were men whose work was to study and interpret God's instruction for the people. For example, uh, Ezra, who is a hero in the Old Testament, uh, is called a scribe. He's a scribe. And so do not read the word scribe and immediately think negatively of the role of the, of, of the work of the scribes. Because you cannot think negatively of Ezra. He's, he's portrayed as a as a good man, as an important man. However, the scribes or the lawyers was another way they were referred to. In Jesus, they tended to go beyond God's word into human traditions. They also tended to quote what other rabbis had said. So a, a, a typical scribal instruction or teaching would go something like, Rabbi so-and-so has said, and then the other rabbi has also said, so a, a lot of quotations and quotations of other rabbis, a lot of attribution and attribution and attribution. And so the cumulative effect of being under the teaching of these scribes was a sense that they really didn't have much authority. Their teaching felt flat. Uh, it felt somewhat removed. And into that milieu comes Jesus. And he's not quoting rabbis. He's not relying on anyone else to make his point. He is instructing out of the rich storehouse of his own wisdom. His teaching is not distant. To disregard his word would be to disregard him. This is Jesus' creed, his doctrine, his teaching. It's an authoritative creed. He has authority and thus speaks with authority. And it is not a derived authority. It is not an authority that he is getting from outside of himself. It is an inherent authority. An authority that is emanating from his own person. This is so new that they are astonished and, and their jaws are just on the floor. The words of Christ are authoritative words. They are not the words of a mere human rabbi that can be discarded or contradicted. See, in the world today, there is too much reveling and celebrating of speculation. One might even say that there is a worship of uncertainty. The humble man in our world is the one who says, I don't know. Uh, we can't know for sure what the truth is. But that's, that's humility. 
The one who comes with an authoritative creed is called the arrogant one. In some quarters, truth is viewed as something relative. It is something that can be true for one person, but not for another. Two plus two is four. That's true for you. But it is not true for me. Truth becomes subjective and relative. But then comes Jesus, the Son of God. He doesn't buy into any of these views of the world. He speaks with authority. And he says, I am the way. Not one of them. I'm it. I am the truth. I am the life. He says, I give life. You try to say that as a human being. I give life. He says, to know me is to have everlasting life. I am the one who brings people God the Father. You see, if you ignore the teaching of Confucius, you'll be fine. If you ignore the teaching of Muhammad, you'll be alright. But if you ignore the teaching of Jesus, you will be condemned. You will perish. Because to ignore the teaching of Jesus is to disobey the authority of Jesus. Saints, Christianity is a dogmatic religion. Some have even said it is a bull dogmatic religion. We are the people of the book. We have an authoritative teaching. Not, ah, uh, we are not sure. Maybe. No, like, this is it. This is the way. And so, dear saints, have you distinguished between what Jesus says and who Jesus is? Ah, what a dangerous thing this is. His teaching is over here and his person is over here. Have you settled into a Christian life where you say you respect Jesus as a person and you think well of him and at the same time you will not do what he says. You will not heed his teaching. If that's you, you are living as a nominal Christian. You will not be saved on the last day because you had great respect for Jesus. You will be saved because you listened to him and you did what he said. That is the evidence of people who have truly come to know Jesus. They obey his teaching. And supreme is his command for people to turn from sin and to trust in him who would later die to secure sinners and to make them disciples of his. Is this it? Have we scoured the span of Jesus' authority? Well, Mark tells us that there is one more element to note, which is our third point. Authority in his command. Authority in his command. So as the people process their amazement, as they recover from the astonishment of his teaching, the authority with which he taught, they are interrupted by the eye of a man in the audience. The man is under the influence of another authority. And immediately there ensues a clash of authority. Jesus and a demon, an unclean spirit that had taken over a man's life. So look at verse 23. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. So here we come to a climax in this story. Uh, Jesus has exerted authority in dealing with men. He's called these disciples, they followed him. He has taught with authority. But you know, one could argue that the four fresh disciples only followed Jesus not because of his authority, but because they liked him and they were up for an adventure. They were a bunch of extroverts who are bored with the life of fishing and they're like 
let's do something else with our lives. Uh, one may say that Jesus taught as one with authority, not because he was God, uh, but because he had a bold and an assertive personality. He's just one of those guys. You know those one of those guys? If you don't know one of those guys, you are one of those guys. Those guys who are very bold and assertive, if they're in a room, you you will know they're there. Uh, they assume that in, if they're in the room, they're the leader. They just come in and they are, they are now in charge. They're the captain. They're the leader. So when they speak, people can feel, you know, dominated by them. If you don't know those people, you are those people. And so one may say that that's, that's the, that's what that authority means. He's just bold and assertive. However, here we see a challenge to Jesus uh, from a different kind of entity altogether. Here we are dealing with an unclean spirit. Uh, we are dealing with a demon. We are dealing with a, 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 a metaphysical, supernatural reality here. In verse 24, the demon yells out. Let's look at what he says. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Now the ask there is confusing. It might mean uh, the demon is speaking on his own behalf and the person he is, he has taken over, uh, which might make the person sort of complicit in their own possession. Or the, the demon is speaking on behalf of himself and other demons who have inhabited this one. So we are not sure. But he says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And then he says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the demon yells out two things, a question about Jesus' intentions and a statement about Jesus' identity. What have you to do with us? Have you come to destroy us? And so immediately we note that the demon is fearful of Jesus. It recognizes him as an authority with power to destroy it. So this is not an equal match between two equal powers. This is not China versus America. This is, this is, uh, uh, an ant and, and you with a boot. Is this the end for me? Is what the demon is asking. Has, has my judgment arrived? And then it also blurts out. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What a statement. Jesus of Nazareth, the, the carpenter's son, Mary's son, is called the Holy One of God. Now this phrase may be probably being taken uh, from Isaiah. Isaiah who constantly refers to God as the Holy One of Israel in which the demon is identifying Jesus as divine. How did it know? Maybe it knew because it was seated in the crowd as Jesus was teaching authoritatively, and the demon could sense this is the voice of God, the authority of God, or perhaps some other sense from having once been in heaven. If we take the view that demons are fallen angels once served in heaven with God, created by God, led in a rebellion by Satan, then they would know the eternal son of God because he is the one who created them. And so the demon rightly identifies Christ as God, Christ as the son of God. Now, side note, so far we have seen Mark point out that Jesus is the Son of God, first verse of our chapter. We have seen him say that John the Baptist points out that Jesus is the Son of God in the baptism and, and the voice of God there. And we have had the voice of God the Father say, You are my beloved Son. And now we have a demon point out that Jesus is God. Witness after witness after witness. This is how Mark starts his book, by just layering. It's like uh, he, he brings a, a courtroom of witnesses, one after the other. Me, Mark, Jesus is the Son of God. John the Baptist is preparing the way for God. God in heaven, tears, tears heaven open, and he says, You are my son, my beloved. And now even a demon is saying, 
He is God. He is the Holy One of God. That's what Mark is doing. That's, that's his argument in the book, that Jesus is the Son of God. So how did Jesus respond to this interruption, uh, this announcement by this demon? Well, he, he exerts his authority once again. Look at verse 25. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. So the one that called the four disciples and they followed him, the one that taught the people with authority now commands the demon. And it's actually two commands that come forth from his lips. Be silent. Come out of here. Be silent. Jesus apparently uh, will not have knowledge of his identity given to people from such a wicked source. And notice that the demon does not speak again after this. And so Jesus' first command is clearly obeyed. The demon basically becomes mute. And then come out of him. Jesus would have the demon release the man it was holding captive. And this, by the way, saints, is a foreshadowing of the kind of thing he came to do. To deliver people from the power of the devil. He could have silenced the demon and left the man under its power. But here we see Jesus will exert his authority not to harm men, but to do them good. Well, is his second command obeyed? Verse 26. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. The unclean spirit, the demon, causes a sin by throwing the man onto the ground and causing him to convulse. It's a kind of a tantrum. The unclean spirit then cries out loudly and does what Jesus commanded. It comes out of the man and we ask the question, why the drama? Why the tantrum? Well, the evil spirit wanted to harm the man even on its way out. Just one last harm to this man. And here we have a snapshot of Satan's goal for humanity. It is to harm and to destroy man. Satan is not your friend. He is not your uncle. He wants to degrade and to shame this man. Jesus seeks to do the opposite. To save and to honor. And we will see him do it over and over again in the gospel according to Mark. Are you here and you are in the grip of Satan? Are you here and you are oppressed by Satan? Oh, we call you to look to the Son of God. He has the authority to help you. A second reason the demon causes this sin uh, is because it doesn't want to obey. It wants to continue possessing and oppressing this poor soul. The demon comes out not because it wants to. It comes because it has to. Jesus' word of command was a powerful word that made the demon leave. Oh, it is the same command that made light shine in darkness in Genesis chapter 1. The same command that flung stars in the sky. The same command that brought forth living things into existence. That command constrains evil and the, and the demon to depart. Even though it was unwilling, still it couldn't but obey. Jesus' command is an active and a powerful command. His command accomplishes whatever it is he desires. Now there will be plenty of times when Jesus, in his capacity as a man, state a desire and not get what he wants. For example, many times he'll tell people, don't tell other people what I've just done for you. And they will go and the opposite. They will go and buy a megaphone and tell people exactly what Jesus has done for them. However, when Jesus issues a command in his capacity as the Son of God, it will be accomplished. The winds and the waves will be calm. 
the ears will be open and the demons will depart. Later, the disciples of Jesus would be unable to cast out a demon and Jesus would tell them that this one does not come out but by prayer and fasting. And then you're like, but Jesus in prayer and fast? Why? Because he is the son of God. He does not need that preparation. He has the authority to quite easily command the demons and they will go. In Acts chapter 13, Paul cast out a demon out of a girl uh, who was, you know, a diviner, following them around for three days, saying these men preached about Jesus, the son of God. Paul got annoyed. And this is how he cast out that demon. Notice the difference. Paul looked at the girl annoyed and he says, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. Did you notice the difference? Jesus didn't say, in the name of her. No, no, no. Jesus said, I command you, come out of him. He actually didn't say, I command you. He didn't even need those words. He just said, come out of him. Everyone else who, who will do exorcisms will do them in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the authority he needs. He doesn't need to invoke any other authority outside of himself. And so this scene leaves an already astonished crowd even more amazed. So look at verse 27. And they were all amazed. Every one of them. To the last man. They are, they are all amazed. So that they, they questioned amongst themselves. So they, they are not drawing a conclusion. They are, they are raising questions. What is this? What is this? At some point the question will become, who is this? But right now it's, it's the situation. What is going on? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Did you notice that this man was in the synagogue? No one else had been able to command that evil spirit. But here comes one with authority in his teaching and he commands and it goes. And so here in, in Mark, we have the first attempt by people to try and understand who Jesus is. What is this? What are we witnessing? Who is this guy? A new phenomenon had arisen in Israel. An authority that had not been seen before. And so word about him spreads like wildfire. Verse 28 says that he becomes a celebrity. He becomes famous. At once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. It could not be any other way. Something new has dawned. So, what's Mark telling us? How will Jesus advance his messianic assignment? Our passage is telling us that he will do so by his authority. What are some of the implications of this truth for us as North Point Baptist Church? I'll give you two implications. One, let us be a church that is ruled by Christ. A church that is actually ruled by Christ. A church that actually honors the authority of Christ. Let us be a church that proclaims his authoritative creed and not our ideas. Let us be a church that submits itself to his teaching, to his authority. Let us have a pulpit that is not just a pulpit, but is a throne from which Jesus rules this church. Not a platform for anybody's self Secondly, let us be a congregation that helps one another follow Jesus. Uh, let us use the authority of Jesus given to us as a congregation for the good of one another. You remember our sermon on the day we started the church from Matthew 16. Jesus gave to the church the keys of the kingdom, which is authority. Let us make it easier for each other to do what God calls us to do. Has Jesus called some of us to be elders or deacons or missionaries, let us affirm and equip and enable their obedience. 
Jesus has called us to be faithful husbands and submissive wives and godly workers and obedient children. Well, let us be a congregation that under Jesus helps its members follow Jesus. Dear saints, what a hope-giving thing it is to know that Jesus has the authority to get the job done. The job of saving us. The job of sanctifying us. The job of protecting us. The job of rewarding us. The job of providing for our souls. The job of equipping us. The job of glorifying us. The job of comforting us. The job of encouraging us. The job of making us mature and godly disciples of Christ. Here in the early stages of his ministry, we are shown that nothing will be able to stop him. There will be challenges that will be leveled against him, but nothing will succeed in getting in his way. He will not lack workers in his kingdom, for he has the authority to call anyone he wants. He will not be stopped by the ignorance, the darkness and the minds of men, for he has an authoritative creed that will arrest and astonish and convict and convert men. He will not be stopped by the powers and the principalities and the rulers of this evil age. For he has the authority to command them to flee. And he has the authority to cause them to loose men from their bondage and their control. And so they are saying, do not despair. If you are laboring under some burden and are dealing with some discouragement, you have a savior who has the authority to finish the good work he has started in you. He is the son of God who has the inherent authority to command whatever resolve he desires in your life. So let us all therefore marvel at a savior who not only has the responsibility, but also has the authority to get the work done. The assignment of Christ will advance by the authority of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have not given the work of our salvation to a Savior who is unable to do it. We thank you, O God, for the confidence that we can have in Jesus. And we pray that you would help us to to live under his rule, uh, to secure ourselves, under his good authority. We pray these things in his name. Amen.